I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. Next week, we begin a new series looking into the politics of Albany, New York, and what some have called the cesspool of corruption that is business as usual there. For almost 75 years, most of the big political decisions, and especially the budget of the state of New York, were decided in secret and apart from any democratic process by three men in a room. These three men, the governor, the Senate majority leader, and the assembly speaker, hold the power in Albany. They're accustomed to getting things done their way. So when freshly elected Elliot Spitzer comes into the governor's office in 2006 and announces everything changes, he is picking a fight. It is one he will not survive, but his ignoble fall isn't the only one. Today, we finish our series on the Balco scandal by talking with the reporting team that broke the story for the San Francisco Chronicle in 2003, Lance Williams and Mark Fainuruwada. They were there at the beginning, reporting on the IRS raid of Balco headquarters, and then the subsequent grand jury, which had world-famous athletes testifying under oath. During the course of their reporting, they cultivated dozens of confidential sources that provided them tips, documents, recordings, and even the secret grand jury testimony of Barry Bonds and Jason Giambi. Lance Williams and Mark Fainuruwada join me from the studios at UC Berkeley. Lance Williams and Mark Fainuruwana, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, this has been a fantastic story, and I'm really happy that we started our American Scandal podcast with this series, because I think it sets a tone for not just what we try to achieve in the podcast, but it's just, it's just a fascinating epic with all sorts of characters. It's a story of fame, money, ambition, drugs. But it's not just the story of Balco and performance-enhancing drugs. In a large part, and why we're speaking to you, is it's a story of journalism. So I was wondering if you could take us back to 2003, when you first started sniffing around and uh, investigating this story. How did it land on your radar, and uh, where did it develop? Well, sure. This is this is Mark. It it actually started um, for us at the San Francisco Chronicle. I, I was a my background's in sports. Uh, I had worked in sports for years, covering games and doing features and doing some investigative. And I was actually on loan at that point to the investigative unit at the Chronicle to see if I could get out of sports. And um, you know this this raid happened at this little lab known as Balco and. Nobody really knew what it was. There was some minor coverage of it in a local paper in in um, in the Bay Area, and uh, there was a little bit of coverage on TV of a local station having covered it. But it was it was reported as a IRS led investigation into this lab that was distributing supplements, um, and I was asked to just sort of follow up on that because the lab. Among the clients were some of the most famous athletes in the world. Most prominent among them was Barry Bonds, who in the Bay Area was certainly the most biggest athlete uh, in in the area. The home run king and uh, chasing uh, the had I think at the time has the single season record is chasing the most hollowed record in all sports, the home run record uh, for career, and um, and then a whole host of other famous athletes were on there. And so I was just asked to to look into this and see if there was anything to it. Um, and the more we started to dig into it and look at it, the more it became clear that, um, A, it was a story about the distribution of performance-enhancing drugs. We started to learn that from some sources. We started to learn that a grand jury had been impaneled to in, sort of talk to those athletes about the drugs they'd been getting. And I think for us at the Chronicle, you know, as we started to get tips and look at this I- idea of Barry Bonds possibly using these drugs, that became... Um, the large story to to go after. Were athletes cheating and and how were they doing it? We thought the uh, odds of getting a publishable story about bonds using steroids were really long in the early going. And in fact, but but 
almost immediately upon getting into the story, I came in after Mark, I heard authoritatively he was using steroids. And I do remember our boss, Steve Cook, on the I-team was at a small meeting of editors, and he started telling uh, them what we were hearing. And one of the other editors said, well, good luck getting that in the paper. It, it, uh, it seemed like an impossible story to, to land, uh, to push past the point of just uh, people telling you stuff off the record. Why would it be impossible? Just because uh, there was no witness or, or, or source willing to go on record? Well, in the early going, we didn't know where we were going to get a, get any sources uh, 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 that would go on the record. Uh, we didn't know where we'd get any documents. And it seemed obvious to us that you were not going to write a story that uh, Barry Bonds used steroids, an unnamed source says. It just wouldn't have had any credibility in those days, unlike today when use of performance-enhancing drugs, it's, that's just known to everybody who's interested in sports. At the time of Balco, most fans and even the people running sports leagues were not aware of the extent to which the drugs had kind of wedged their way into into uh, into the game. And I also don't think we we had not processed at that point the scope of the investigation and the idea that that there were going to be so many documents created, interviews generated, where people were going to be not only before the grand jury, but interviewed outside the grand jury and, and, and under, you know, basically under threat of perjury if they didn't tell the truth when being interviewed by investigators. And, you know, I think the idea of performance enhancing use amongst baseball players, for example, there had been stories about it, but all in this sort of anonymous kind of way. And, and they didn't resonate. Um, you needed, you know, you needed to be able to authoritatively say something through documents. And the, and the reason that Balco really resonated in a way that no other stories had is because you had the power of the federal government investigating. When did this break open for you? What was the moment, the witness, the testimony, the, the story, the tip, the document that finally revealed to you that this is a bigger story than you imagined and you can follow it to its end? I think each of us had our own aha moments. Uh, mine came when I was with a source who had been telling me that there was a recording of Barry Bond's trainer, Greg Anderson, describing the drug regimen he'd been giving to Bonds, that there was a secret recording. This guy had told me that. And weeks passed, and then one day he met me and, uh, and played it for me. And it was exactly as, ad as advertised, and I was really impressed and I could not wait to get back to the office to tell my partner and the boss what I had just heard. For me, I, I think the moment, you know, it's really interesting the way this story progressed. There's a sort of trickling up in many ways of, of how the story unfolds. For me, the, the moment was when, when a source showed me an investigative document um, in which um, the names of several athletes, including Bonds, were laid out and listed as having received these drugs from Victor Conti, the the leader of Balco, um, as part of the, the the sort of conspiracy. And so, you know, we had always been talking about we need a document. We need something that we can sort of hang our hat on um, to be able to publish. And so, um, to me, seeing that document was an, another run back to the office moment, call the office and, and tell Lance and excitedly know that we had a story that was going to be, you know, I think what we thought was a bombshell. I do think what's interesting, though, is, of course, in all of these cases, the stories had, had varying impact. You know, I think we thought they'd have more impact than others. For example, this story I just described, when we published it, amongst Giants fans, the first reaction was, well, you're saying he got the drugs, but it doesn't necessarily mean he used the drugs. And, and there was a lot of that kind of reaction as stories played out. There were questions about the authenticity of that recording Lance was talking about or other excuses for why it might not be real. And so the story doesn't really explode in a, in a almost, con, um, you know, confirming kind of way until we publish, um, at least as it relates to the baseball players, in, in the December of 2004 when we published the grand jury testimony of Bonds, Jason Giambi, and other baseball players. How did you guys team up? It sounds like, Mark, you, you, you were the first one on the story, but then it developed into something bigger and needed a team? Well, Mark and I were sharing a sort of uh, oh, oversized phone booth <laughs> workspace uh, when he came over from sports. 
And I was working on a, a political story, but I could hear him over there, what he was doing. And, and he was popping big stories really early on. It was a really impressive effort. And then you're right, the, the boss thought the story was just too competitive for, for one guy to handle. And he brought me in and told me he wanted me to go on the story. And I'm usually up, up for anything. That was one of the few times I've ever tried to beg off a story because I, I said, you know, he's doing such a great job. He's wired up all these sources, and I just don't see how I can be of any help. And uh, so the boss said, uh, okay, well, look, I, I just want you to come on and pull some paper, that is, pull public records for him, get some documents, and I promise you, you'll be off the story by Christmas. And uh, to my boss's credit, he didn't say Christmas of what year, because that was <laughs> 2004, and I think I wrote my last Balco story in 2012. Right. I mean, I, I will just say, like, I, you know, Lance is a humble guy, and, and I felt from the beginning this story was... You know, I, I don't think we knew how long it would last, certainly not as long as it did, but the scope of it was huge and the level of reporting um, was intense. And I think we felt the com competition was intense too. And so for me, um, I was thrilled both because I knew how good Lance was, but also because I knew I wanted help um, to have him on. And I, I it didn't necessarily envision it was a short-term thing. And I you know, I think it bared out. We, we, it's really worked out. I mean, I, I've been really lucky to work with him. Um, the partnership was perfect in so many ways. We, we developed different series of sources. We had different ways about going the job, about the job. And, um, you know, and, and we had different levels of sort of experience and expertise in various areas of the story. So, um, it was really a, a, a perfect partnership. On a good day. <laughs> This case seems to be almost completely driven by sources coming to you with information. And, uh, of course, that's probably not the case that it just lands in your lap. There's a lot of work behind the scenes. But for anyone listening that's not in journalism, how does that happen? How do you develop relationships? How do you get a, a source wired up? You know, um, in my case, the day or two days after I was assigned to this story, when I had no idea what I was going to do, I didn't know much about sports. I didn't have any uh, performance-enhancing drugs expertise at all. I met a guy that I had first met like 25 years earlier, three newspapers ago, uh, who had been a source for me on stuff occasionally over the years. We just happened to get together on a totally different topic. And at the end of our meeting, he said, do you know about this Balco case? And I said, well, you know, they just assigned me to work on it. I don't know anything about it. And he said, I know some people who know the whole story of Barry Bonds and steroids. Maybe I'll introduce you to them. And so it was that easy. I just had to keep in touch with a source for 25 years <laughs> and it fell into my lap. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing. Lance makes light of that, but I, you know, I don't know a lot of people that who are that good at, at sort of maintaining relationships. And I, I do think that's a part of the job that he's good at really many things, but that's a part of the job he's really good at. And, and it served us well, incredibly well in the story. I, I think that the thing, I mean, I say this to journalism students, whenever somebody's stupid enough to ask me to talk to journalism students, it's, you know, uh, Developing sources is a really personal thing. I think you've just got to be yourself. But I, I think one of the things that Lance and I were really conscious of as we talked to people was, you know, in this case, a lot was playing out in secret because of the way that because it was a grand jury investigation, because the federal government doesn't offer a lot about what it's doing. And so I think we made a point of really educating ourselves about the story, about the drugs that were being used, about the different people involved. Um, and we knew elements of the story that other people didn't know. And so when you got on the phone with somebody um, for the first time, you demonstrated a level of knowledge and interest and passion about the story um, that I think convinced them that you were serious and legitimate um, and that, that you were going to keep promises if that was necessary, too. And so I think people generally respected that and were appreciative of the fact that we could f inform them in some ways about things that they didn't really understand or know about the story. I sat in that uh, phone booth before I came on the story, listening to him work the phones, and it was very impressive, this uh, disarming manner, uh, this knowledgeable guy with a sports background, and many of the people he was calling were uh, people in the sports world, and then 
very explicit as to uh, the information he wanted to print and how he would source it. Uh, it was it was really impressive, cold call friend making, as I call it. And, and by the time I came on the story, he had a source list of about 60 people, everyone from scientists to sports agents to athletes, that he had already reached out to and was working for Info. It was really something. Well, let's stick with sources because this story gets personal for both of you uh, in regards to the sources you cultivated. I'm wondering if you can tell the story of when you confronted the law, who's pressuring you to, um, to reveal your sources. The grand jury testimony was leaked to you. So could, could you go through the story of, of what happened? In this story, dealing with sources, uh, we were... Uh, explicit with them about the kind of protection we would give to them if uh, if uh, anything went wrong. We knew that the information we wanted was sensitive. We knew there were at least a theoretical uh, possibility that either the athletes themselves through a defamation case or even the government might try to learn who our sources was. And we, we thought about it and we promised flat out, we're not going to give you up. And we made that promise to Half a dozen people, anyway, in that in that in that uh, story at various times, and so um, when the government came after us, uh, there was no no real wiggle room. You would either have to go back on your word and betray people who had really extended themselves to help you, or you had to stand up to the government. That was the choice we faced, and it wasn't much of a choice, was it? No, I mean, I so you know we. We, this all played out for us over, you know, we, we were working sources repeatedly from the beginning of the story. And, and because the, you know, the story, the, the, the grand jury was meeting in secret and because the feds were not talking about it, much of the information is trying to be gathered through confidential sources. And, you know, I, I think we're reassuring people that, that if the time comes and somebody comes after them, we're going to be there to protect them. And I, I think in practice, we, you know, it's a promise we've made time and again in our lives in the course of doing our jobs. And, and not that we took it lightly, but that we'd done it so many times. I don't think you necessarily go through thinking sort of it's going to get to the next step. But ultimately, in our case, the the judge got seemingly upset about it or people were worked up about it. And an investigation was launched in which the FBI began to look into who the source was of uh, providing us with with uh, the grand jury material. Um, and the result was in the fall of 2006, um, we received subpoenas from the federal government ordering us to testify. And the upshot of that was either come and tell us where you got this stuff or face up to 18 months in prison. And, um, and as Lance said, I, I think that process was difficult on a number of levels. We were meeting with lawyers and talking to our lawyer regularly. It was interrupting our jobs. It became very personal. We had to talk to our families about it. It became very public. Um, but the one part of the equation that was the simplest piece was we were made a promise and we were going to keep that promise. And so, indeed, the time came and um, at one point along the way after the subpoenas were issued where we had to go before a judge and, um, and tell the judge we were not going to break that promise. And the judge indeed sentenced us to up to 18 months in prison. And the only nice thing he did that day was allow us to stay out on appeal. And during the course of the appeal process, um, the federal government continued to investigate and f- see if they could figure out the source of the leaks. And ultimately, um, they announced, separate from the work they were trying to convince us to do on their behalf, that they had found the source of the leaks. And they prosecuted uh, a lawyer who had been connected with the case. Um, and it was a very bittersweet moment, I think, for us, continues to be to this day, that in the end, um, that person was sentenced to two years in prison, um, more than twice the time of any of the other drug dealers or or the athletes in the case, um, and became sort of the face of the case in some negative fashion. And I, I think Lance and I both agree that the people who helped us with the story, particularly that person, 
um, were whistleblowers in the, the highest order. There's a war on whistleblowers in the United States. It began under Bush in the current era. President Bush is Attorney General Gonzalez. It continued under President Obama, and it continues to this day under President Trump. And the reporters are just squeezed to get the whistleblowers because government doesn't like its secrets made public. And that's all that was going on. When our lawyers first looked at our grand jury stories, they did not think we were in jeopardy of of getting into a source case. They thought we had a problem with defamation that we had to work through. What if one of the athletes sued? It was only as the Bush Justice Department ramped up some other cases that it became clear that, oh, suddenly it was uh, open season on the press to get at uh, the people uh, telling truths that uh, the government preferred not to have be known. It's interesting when, you know, one of the the people who was incredibly supportive when we were going through our our legal battle was a guy named Mark Corallo, who was uh, uh, um, worked under Attorney General Ashcroft uh, for years and, and, and was quite familiar with the process of subpoenaing reporters. It was part of his role. Uh, he worked with reporters and was part of his role at Justice to understand that dynamic. And uh, Corallo became a big advocate of ours because he recognized that the Bush administration was abusing that process, that there was no legitimate reason for subpoenaing us. There was no threat to anyone's physical well-being to subpoena us. There was no um, um, issue of a, of a foreign a threat to, to a terrorist kind of threat, um, the kinds of things that typically would be required to issue subpoenas of reporters. And so Corallo went to bat for us significantly, but but I think he recognized that there was a shift going on. And, and as Lance alluded to, um, it was hardly isolated to the Bush administration. The Obama administration was aggressive in going after reporters in ways that others had not. And, and clearly we see in the Trump administration this has continued. So I think it's a huge, a huge concern um, you know, that ours is but one small example of many that have gone on over the course of the last decade or two. Troy Ellerman was the lawyer who uh, originally represented Victor Conti, and he was the source of the leak and paid his price for doing so. Having provided you these documents, did he describe why he was doing it or, or then again, why he, um, he owned up to it? Well, I, I think I, I would say we've always been really careful about talking about this issue, just more out of respect for sourcing than anything else. But I, I think what, what is safe to say, because he himself has publicly said this at, at points on, he went on ESPN at one point and and um, and the message I think was clear from all our sources, including him, was they thought the case was a joke. That the federal government was prosecuting this in a way as if it was some massive um, drug trial, drug case in which they were going after the users to get the dealers. Um, and so when you looked at the public documents that were released in the case, all the names of the athletes were either redacted or referenced in generic terms. And so they seemed to be the government seemed to be protecting the athletes going out of their way. Um, and that seemed to be upside down because in reality, this case was the users were the multi, in many cases, the multi-million dollar athletes making many, many more millions by virtue of using the drugs. And the dealers were just random low level guys that nobody had ever heard of. And so I think virtually everybody who cooperated with us in this case, the dynamic was the same. Why are the athletes being protected? That's not a public service and these guys need to be exposed. Um, you know, in the end, in terms of how Ellerman gets caught, the story of that is laid out in documents in which um, a former colleague of his and a, a employee of his, um, their relationship turns sour, and that person wears a wire on him uh, because the federal government comes to that person and sort of squeezes them, and um, or at least suggests there's some squeezing and. That person turns on Ellerman and wears a wire, and one thing leads to another. It's interesting that the uh, federal government decided to prosecute the drug dealers as opposed to the the athletes. That's not really the case that IRS agent Jeff Nowitzki seemed to have been pursuing. Um, we've characterized his desires as um, as going after not so much Victor Conti and Balco, but but the players themselves. That his motivation was the cheating and not the means for for how you did that. Do you have any indication of, of how 
that focus of the investigation or, or the pursuit of justice shifted? I never had insights into what motivated Nowitzki other than he's a really aggressive lawman. Um, the case was put together by the U.S. Attorney's Office in San Francisco, and I think the key decisions were when they decided to uh, grant uh, immunity to the athletes if they testified truthfully in front of the grand jury. Uh, and that probably was just a product of the fact that simple steroid possession is hardly a crime at all at the time under, under uh, federal and state laws. Steroid dealing was a little more of a crime. Uh, and uh, so the dynamic of the case was sort of framed by the statute. There, there are many sides to this story and many different ways to digest what it might mean to us. But since you have been at the center of it from, from the beginning, I was wondering what you would say the moral of this tale is. What have we learned as a society, as, as, as what has baseball learned? What has America learned from Balco? I mean, I, I, it's funny. I've never seen it as a morality play, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I think Lance and I were like, we're doing our jobs and we like our jobs and it's a really cool story and it ends up consuming us in ways we never imagined. I, I do think, though, that, you know, I think there are some important lessons out of it that aren't necessarily sort of about morals, but are just realities for, for, the, for, for anybody who is interested, you know, in, in sports, for example. Um, you know, I think there was a real realization for everybody that these drugs are vastly more pervasive than anybody wanted to acknowledge, that they're impacting sports in ways that people have not wanted to acknowledge, and that what we're seeing on the fields of play um, are not necessarily real, or they're real in the context of a lot of people using these drugs. And so it forced us to come to grips and ask questions that I think a lot of us have never wanted to ask as fans. You know, and, and some people have complained about this notion that you know, now somebody performs at a high level and there's a level of skepticism about that. And I've always viewed it differently, which is that for years, these these feats were happening without any level of skepticism whatsoever. And so for people to be asking the questions and wondering, I think is a healthy thing. Um, so I, I, I think that's one of, of many things that come out of it. There's a whole series of journalism things we've been discussing previously in terms of um, its impact um, and then there's a the whole question of youth and steroids. So I think there's a lot comes out of it. I, I don't know how much of it I, I think of in terms of, of morality lessons as much as I think of in terms of just overall awareness. If you got into the story, you could confront in yourself the question of, are you the sort of person who believes that the choice is cheat or lose? And which do you pick? Do you think that is the choice? The elite athletes thought that was the choice almost almost always. Uh, uh, the temptation was uh, to use the drug because if you don't, somebody else will, and they'll get the contract or the big hit or uh, uh, win the race. And so there was intense pressure. And there, it was rare that you found in this cast of characters people who would say, well, you know, I'm just not going to do that. Um, it's a interesting dilemma. We put these young athletes in by introducing the drugs uh, to, to the world and then just letting them sort it out. It's really true. It, it was rare also to find anybody who had deep regret about it as well. I think there was this, this, I remember we, we, as we doing the reporting, it became clear that, that when there were investigators talking to track athletes, and they were interviewing them about the level of cheating that they believe existed. One of them said, if you looked at a 100-meter final at the Olympics, they believe six out of the eight finalists would have been juicing. The other one said, oh, no, 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 all of them would have been juicing. So I, I think there was a, a recognition amongst the athletes that this was the price of doing business. And in Balco, I think what was fascinating about that was the levels to which people would go. You had athletes taking a whole range of drugs, concocting a mix of, of drugs that that were being provided to them, some of which which were designed for animals, 
um, others of which were designer steroids that hadn't been tested on anybody. Um, people were willing to make themselves into human lab rats for the purposes of, of succeeding at the highest levels. I always thought that uh, the athletes bore perhaps more blame or, or got more blame than they deserved, and the proprietors of the sport uh, got less. Uh, you know, these are young people, really ambitious, really no sense of their own mortality. You take a 22-year-old track athlete or something, really want to be successful, and then you allow them access to this stuff. I think the leagues and the institutions had the responsibility to protect the athletes from their their own uh, competitive impulses. Uh, You may remember Tim Montgomery telling Victor Conti, I'll take anything. I don't care what it does to me. I don't care if it kills me as I cross the finish line, as long as I can set the 100-meter record. And that's that's an awesome impulse in sports to be that dedicated to your sport. But somebody's got to, some adult's got to step in and say, well, wait, 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 we can't do that. We can't let these guys do this. Well, I, if there were going to be adults in the room, it wouldn't be the fans. Uh, they faced their own dilemmas. And, and in many ways, they were deliberate in their ignorance of doping in baseball. You know, I don't think fans thought baseball players took banned drugs because of their physiology and so forth and the sport. It's not like football where the guys are giants and so forth. I mean, a baseball team in the 80s, they look like just sort of regular guys in a way, at least from the second deck. Um, You know, and it's sports. And they love sports and they love their amusement. And so they just don't want to hear the negative stuff. That was the other part of it. For the Giants fans, Giants had been a pretty bad team for quite a while. The one thing interesting about them was this spectacular slugging outfielder. And now you tell me it's all phony. People in San Francisco got so angry with us. Um, A lot of, uh, you know, uh, mean stuff. But... uh, to me, the more troubling stuff was the guys uh, who would write in and say, thanks for destroying something special. I was about to have this great year following baseball. Now you've wrecked it. And it's like, wow. Uh, but we care a lot about our amusements in the United States, and it was just more proof of that. I think for baseball, too, you know, that that sport is so uh, immersed in the numbers in ways that – and the statistics in ways that other sports are not – um, that that people hold those those numbers up as um, in in sort of godlike fashion in some ways, and so they they really hold on to them. And so the the notion that the home run records, the most hollowed record, arguably in all of sports, was a fallacy, um, I think was hard for some people to buy, digest. As as Lance used to joke, like the 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 it was really interesting, not and not even really funny, but it was just a funny line that in reality the. The, the further we got away from home plate at Pac Bell Park, the nicer people were to us. But the closer you got to, to home plate, the more vitriol and, and hostility we got. So the book comes out, and that's in 2006. But this story continues and continues. How has this Balco story interwoven into your lives? I mean, you, you're almost defined by it at this point, certainly as a pair. At the time, Mark used to say, this is a story of a lifetime. And I always said, no, it's not, because I'm a future-oriented person, and I always think my next one's going to be my big one. Uh, and I've done some stuff since that I'm really proud of, but Mark's absolutely right. You know, we covered this for eight or nine years, uh, wrote a book. Uh, the Bonds perjury trial really was our book coming back to life, all these people that we had interviewed telling the same stories under oath to the Grand jury, the experientially for as a as a writer, that's just so interesting and well, maybe a little unsettling. Um, and here we are, so many years later, talking to you about it. I mean, I I think you know this story shaped and changed me in ways that I I never would have imagined. Not least, I mean, yes, we've been covering it for eight years, and it still keeps coming up or more. Um, you know, I have this lifelong friendship and partnership now with the guy sitting next to me that um, I value as much as anything. I learned an incredible amount about how to do my job from him and the process. Um, but I also think, you know, the the legal battle we went through and, um, you know, and this notion that somehow we've 
played any part in sort of informing and enlightening people about the extent of the use of the drugs, the dangers of the drugs of, for use, all of that stuff is, um, you know, it's 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 life altering. It sticks with you. It's never going away. And you know, very very few days go by where I don't think about Balco in some fashion. Whether it's my relationship with Lance, whether it's what happened to the sources, um, whether it's uh, around steroids. Um, you know, it's just a. It just clearly has been a, a life-altering thing. And there's stuff about it that I, I hate happened. The legal piece is one of them, both because it jeopardized us, but it put our families in a really, you know, crappy position and an un- uncomfortable one. And um, and uh, I would not have wished that on anybody. Um, but but overall, I have this incredibly powerful feeling around it that makes me really happy when I think about it. Gentlemen, thank you so much for speaking with me today. It's our pleasure. It really was our pleasure. Thanks for having us. From Wondery, this is episode six of six of Balco for American Scandal. On our next series, we look at political corruption in Albany, New York, and how the infighting in the state capitol there got very personal for Elliot Spitzer. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Sound designed by Derek Barrons. This episode is written by Hannibal Diaz. Our senior producer and editor is Karen Lowe. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.